Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. We are glad you are here. We are going to do something we don't normally do. Uh, we've got a little business meeting that we need to have real quick. Um, we are ordaining and installing elders and deacons today and uh, we had a resignation um, in the class of 2020, and the nomination committee has found somebody to fill that. We just need to handle that business so that individual can be installed. So it won't take but a second, I don't think, but I'm going to ask us to bow in prayer and open the congregational meeting. Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you be with us as we conduct your business and the uh, life of the church. We ask that you would guide and direct us. We thank you for those who are serving this day, and we look forward to the opportunity to ordain and install them as officers in the church. Be with us as we elect a final officer to fill our ranks, Lord, and be with and bless them, each and every one. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So we have a quorum. The clerk of the session, Walter Neely, will serve as a clerk of this meeting. And Barry wasn't expecting this, but real quick, Barry, come and... Tell me the one name, and I don't have anything but this. <laughs> the nominating committee would like to place Harry Davenport as the elder, or deacon. deacon, I'm sorry, for the year term of 2020. Any nominations from the floor? In that case, I would entertain a motion that the nominations be closed and Harry be elected by acclamation, and he will be installed during the service today. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed no. It is so ordered. Thank you very much. Let's uh, bow together in prayer. Eternal God, we ask your blessing as we leave this time where we conduct your business in the life of the church and as we enter into worship. Fill us with your spirit that we might worship in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, I want to call your attention just to a couple of announcements. Um, we certainly celebrate the gift of the flowers today given to the glory of God by Pam Schubert. And in memory of Bill Schubert or Billy Bob, as many of us knew him to be on his birthday. And we appreciate that very much. Um, also, um, we are having a Valentine's lunch after church on the 9th. So you do need to make reservations. Contact information is there. Hope you will plan to be with us for that time of fellowship and celebration. We're also looking for volunteers to help out with the sound and video. And uh, that meeting is going to take place um, on the 9th as well. So you can stay, get a little orientation, find out if that might be something you're interested in, and then join us for lunch. Um, and I do want to remind you that there is a congregational meeting next Sunday uh, after worship um, just for some routine church business uh, 2019 wrap up 2020 budget uh, pastors terms of call and some things like that so just keep that in mind any other announcements concerns we need to share today yes Marion Okay, that's our Ash County ministry. Ash County is the poorest county in North Carolina. Um, and through various connections in the life of the church, we've been doing that for over 40 years. Um, and your donations are collected here, and twice a year we go up. And so it was, they loaded the truck Friday. They went up yesterday. And uh, what, what we take up there, most, mostly clothing and small items, um, greatly needed and appreciated. And we thank everybody. Anything else? Yes. Okay. So talk to Jared if you're interested in going on the Honduras mission trip. And Mike, you want to remind the deacons? That... Okay, you're actually going to meet in the parlor. Deacons are going to meet in the parlor immediately after worship today. Anything else? Well, we are glad you're here. And we ask and pray God's blessing upon us as we continue to worship God. Welcome to church. If you'd please stand, and we're going to sing some songs together. Amazing grace. 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. do another. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 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 
Please be seated. Amen, amen. We come to that portion of our worship where we are mindful of all that God has given us, all that God has enabled us to do, all that God has blessed us with, all that we have experienced in life, the goodness and love of life is at His hand. And so we come and return a portion of that which we've been blessed with, not just the monetary offering we might place in the plate, but I pray that as the praise team sings once more that we'll be pondering what it is that God is asking for us as a commitment in our hearts of our time and our talents, and that in that way we'll worship God. So let's bow together and offer God our offering. Gracious Lord, we pray that you would take what we are about to give, use it, bless it, multiply it, enable it to do far more than we could in any way do on our own, Lord. Take us, our gifts, use them to bring glory and honor to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In the morning when I rise to meet you In the morning when I lift my eyes You're the only one I want to cling to You're the first thought on my mind So let our voices rise All creation cries Singing out in it Hallelujah from this moment on join with heaven's song singing out in endless
Our scripture lessons for today come to us from the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter, and also from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Before we turn to God's Word, let us seek His guidance. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we need so desperately in the time in which we live to hear the truth, your truth, your Word. Your call, so different from the world around us that puts us at odds with one another and calls us into conflict. Your word calls us into service, calls us into peace, calls us into welcome. And so, O Lord, we pray that we might tune out the clamor of the world and instead hear, receive, and obey your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Those of you who are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? Isaiah declares, listen to me, O coastlands, pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him, For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, The one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers, kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, on a day of salvation I have helped you, I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages saying to the prisoners, come out to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the ways on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. And then from the Gospel of John, two disciples heard him, that is John the Baptist, say uh, a word about Jesus as the one coming into the world, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. 
you are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the children to come up and join Miss Lori. Follow me. Yeah, we're going to go up these steps today. Thanks. You don't have to. You can sit right there. Is everybody settled? Come on up. All right. Good to see you all. Yes, you've all fit. That's perfect. <laughs> so... Some of you may be, have out, maybe you don't do this in school anymore because you've gotten older, but do you remember having show and tell time in school? Do some of you still get to do show and tell in school? Yes, yes. yes some of you do. Do you like show and tell? You don't get to? Yeah. It was like a, it's like when a, a, a special time. I know when my kids did it, it was like it, we took a lot of time deciding what we were going to take to show and tell because it was a really important day when you got to do that. And it's because you take something special, something that's special to you, and you get to share it with your friends. So it's kind of an exciting time when you get to do that. Well, today's Bible verse is about somebody who, it was kind of like show and tell. John, he showed and told about Jesus. And that was something that was very important to him. He spent almost his entire adult life telling people about Jesus, either that Jesus was coming or when he was there that he was introducing them to Jesus. So there, there were a lot of people that learned about Jesus and got to know Jesus because of John, because of his show and telling. And so with that in mind, sometimes, you know, when we read the Bible, some of those things are examples of what maybe we can do in our lives, right? So we need to show and tell about Jesus. And so first we need to show them about Jesus. And, and how would we do that? Maybe by the way we live. Well, we do the things that Jesus has taught us to do. Maybe that looks like being kind to somebody that's maybe different from you or being patient with your siblings. Ha <laughs> you laughed at that one? <laughs> or it might be um, sharing things that you have with those who don't. There's a lot of ways that we can show Jesus to people. And then once we show Jesus, then we take the next step and we tell them about Jesus. We tell them about Jesus' love for us. We tell them about how all the things that he has done for us. And then we especially tell them how much he loves them, too. So we can show and tell. And I know that your show and tell at school is very exciting, but really this is even more exciting. We have an opportunity every day to show and tell about Jesus. All right, let's pray, and then some of you will continue talking about this in Jay Walkers. Dear God... Thank you for John and his example of how we should share the news of Jesus with everyone. Help us to be excited every day to show and tell about you and your love. Amen. All right, those of you in preschool, kindergarten, first grade, we're going to keep going out the side here to jaywalkers.
in our scripture for today, and obviously by the title, I'm reflecting on the reality that um, Isaiah proclaims that God called him in the womb, and that he named him in the womb, and that uh, in the womb he prepared him for what he was to do. And so as I was reflecting on um, that and how I would draw a connection to the Word and and what we encounter and what we do on a daily basis, um, I recall one of my favorite baby stories, Um, silly little story, but uh, I always got a kick at it. Some of you may have heard it before. There was um, a young couple, and they were expecting a baby. They, They knew it was a boy, and they already had a little girl. And so they were um, modern, intent in all of their ways, and they they wanted their daughter to be a part of this, that it would be a family event as much as possible. And so they made plans, talked about it with the doctor, about bringing her in when the baby was born. And they shielded her from the things that she shouldn't see, but they allowed her to be in there, and she was there when the doctor delivered the baby and held him up and smacked him on the bottom and cried out the first time. And she had this look of concern and confusion on her face. And then she looked up at the doctor and said, Hit him again, doctor. He had no business crawling up in there in the first place. (laughs) So we're going to talk a little bit about born, being born, what it means to be born, not necessarily physically in the world, although in part, but also being born into God's kingdom and born into the work to which God has called us. And as I was reflecting on this, I I ran across some interesting information about the uh, Human Genome Project, which was one of the greatest feats of exploration in history. Because rather than exploration of the planet or the cosmos or the seas, the uh, human genome project was an inward voyage to discover um, the internet it was led by an international team and it was basically to discover a sequence and a map of all the genes known to us uh, in the species of humans or homo sapiens and so that's what this project was about Um, and a genome is an organism's complete set of DNA, including all of its various genes. And each genome contains all the information needed to build and maintain that organism. In humans, a copy of the entire genome, more than 3 billion DNA base pairs, is contained in all the cells that have a nucleus. So just that alone blows your mind, the detail in which we are created. Just kind of almost overwhelming. And um, as I was reading about this, I I was surprised to discover that there was a Supreme Court case back in June of 2014 that companies cannot claim inventors' rights on the works of God, or so says the Supreme Court, and a unanimous decision. Now, they didn't say works of God. Um, They said... Uh, The court's decision referred to a product of nature. But if you believe God is the creator of the world, you're justified in making that assumption. And it had to do with a company called Myriad who basically patented um, a, a series of genes. And those genes, they were able to to select out and to mark out and use as a test for women for early indicators of breast or ovarian cancer. And so they patented this process. And then others started complaining, you can't patent a gene because when they did that, nobody else could do the test. And Myriad could charge whatever they wanted for it. And so it went to court, and the Supreme Court basically said, um, you know, that's not going to happen. We'll get to that in just a minute. But because Myriad had been granted this patent, um, it was charging these astronomical amounts And uh, some of the other companies, uh, medical companies, took them to court. And it it ended up in the Supreme Court. And Clarence Thomas kind of wrote the deciding decision when he said, Myriad did not create anything. 
To be sure, it found an important and useful gene, but spreading that, separating that gene from its surrounding genetic material is not an act of invention. It's a step in learning more about what God has created, but God, not myriad, is the inventor of human DNA and all of its complexity. It's true, of course, that the Human Genome Project has enabled the medical world to know a lot more about us. And indeed, since the passing of that Supreme Court case, now you can get your genetic testing done in any number of ways, a myriad of ways, but not with them necessarily. And so a lot of us, we see these things on TV and we look at them, uh, and a lot of us have ordered them. I'm not going to ask, but Ancestry DNA. 23 and me, my heritage DNA, living DNA, and others. I would point out that there are some risks associated with participating in these organizations if you choose to do that. There are also some huge benefits to find out things about your ancestry and possible health concerns. But the biggest issue, of course, is privacy. And what and how do they guard your privacy? and the reality that your DNA could lead to others. So although your DNA is unique to you, no other DNA on earth like it, there are trends within your DNA to make and to uh, uh, point out family connections and things like that. Some of you may remember it was back in 2018 when authorities used uh, a free genealogy and DNA database called GED Match to track down what was known as the Golden State Killer, who from 1976 to 1986 was involved in over 12 homicides and 50 rapes out on the West Coast. Turned out to be a police officer. All these many years later, they identified him, and he's still waiting trial today. So there are some inherent risks with this, but the interesting thing is science knows us well. Science can determine our predisposition towards certain disease or cancers. Um, it can tell us about our ancestry, where we come from. It can tell us, you know, what is our heritage. A lot of things that a lot of people are interested in knowing about. But the fact of the matter is, science cannot know us as well as God. Isaiah says, The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, He named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver, and he hid me away. The idea of being named while still in the womb is not foreign to any of us. For many of us have named our children or grandchildren before they were born. Most of us are used to having gender reveals. Not sure if that's politically correct, but that's what we do. Gender reveals, and then we name the child. I know um, m many of you know, most of you know, that Miriam and I are enjoying our first grandson. He's two months old. He's over here sleeping through the sermon. We're teaching him early how to get by in church. So. Um, but Caroline and Matt, just with family, not a, not a party, but just with family and most immediate friends, they had a gender reveal and told us they were having a little boy. And then they had the name already picked out. And so uh, Miriam and Matt's mom, Shelly, did a name scramble. They had all these letters and they were supposed to figure out the name. Well, Miller was pretty quick and they both knew that Matt's family has a tradition where the son carries the father's first name as a middle name. So they got Matthew Miller pretty quick. And then they basically had EZRA. Only they didn't know it was Ezra at that point, and they're spinning it around. And so they're spinning them around and putting it down, and they both step back and say, Raz! <laughs> no, it's not Raz. <laughs> and turn it around, and it was Ezra. So we've all been through that process. We understand what it's like to even name our own children in the womb. Uh, in biblical times, being responsible for naming someone um, was also a way of claiming someone. When you knew their name or called their name, you, you had a claim on who they were. And so a lot of times you will hear 
in biblical stories questions about names. Uh, and you know, even Jesus asked his disciples, "Who do the people say that I am?" Because it's a claim upon him whether they understand him to be the Messiah or or someone else. So it's it's a it's a common practice, particularly in biblical times, the idea of being named. Now, I'm not going to go there, but there are multiple references in the scriptures to being known by God, to being knitted together in our mother's womb. All kinds of things that make it very difficult to understand how we can in any way, shape, or form uh, radically support abortion. And I I understand that's a a political issue, and I don't really want to get involved in it, but there's no doubt that that human being in the womb is known to God, called by name, by God. But as Isaiah is doing it, he says, Now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. It's not enough. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Again, we've talked about this before. The 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 reality that the people of Israel were always intended to be salvation, not just for them, but for all of humanity, for the Gentiles as well. And even though the servant Isaiah can say, for this I was born, we should not assume that he possessed the knowledge from the time he was old enough to think. Some people do have a sense of call from early on in life. They know from as, as young as they can start to conceive that they, are, they were want to be, they were called to be, they were born to be a nurse or a doctor or a coach or a teacher or a care provider or some even a pastor. And it, it's almost a part, if you will, of their DNA. They just have always known. Jesus was like that. When Pilate asked him when he was being examined before Pilate, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And in another spot in Luke, when his parents lost track of him, you know, on the way back from Jerusalem, and they found him with the elders in the temple, and his mother said to him, where were you? And he says, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house and about his business. So Jesus knew. But the reality is most of us become aware over time of having a special purpose. We realize this only gradually, sometimes only in retrospect. Sandra Gibson, a graduate of, in 2008 of Austin Seminary, wrote, I suspect that one of the nicest gifts God gives any of us in a history is that we have the lens of retrospection, that we can look back. We don't have the blueprints, but we have abilities to connect the dots and see where God has been at work in our lives. That's the way it is for most of us. We look back and we understand how God has been at work in our lives. That's the famous footprints in the sand little uh, saying that we like so much that, that we look back and we see and we know that in the worst of the times we weren't alone, we were carried, literally carried by God. We heard some testimonies this morning from our officers elect about their life story and many of them talked about being able to look back and see God at work in their lives. And the reality is that we have a call from God. And we may not use the language that we were born for some role. We may not speak of being named by God. We may not even characterize ourselves as being called by God. But if at some point it comes to us that we're in the place that we need to be because we can do some good here where we are, it's worth considering whether that that may indeed be evidence of God's call. Wherever you are, it's possible, highly likely, that God has a call for you in that place. 
even if it's a difficult place, that God has something for you to do there, some way to apply yourself there. And it's important that we apply ourselves. Um, Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the Secretary General of the UN from 1953 to 1961, says, we are not permitted to choose the frame of our destiny, but what we put into it is ours. That's another way of saying that while we may be born for some purpose, it's still up to us what we do about that purpose. So, as we move through life, it's a good time to consider whether we have some sense of being named by God, called by God for this particular person, purpose, for being born into this role, or simply being the right person at the right time in a place that God wants us to be, and which in itself is indeed a naming, a calling from God. Our officers have and are wrestling with this very thing. We all, in the life of the leadership of the church, feel inadequate, unworthy of the task. But the inadequacy only highlights what God can do through us if we but apply ourselves in every way that we can and we let God use us to serve His purpose. And that's true of all of us in the life of the church. Many of us are called to teach or to lead the youth or to care for our children or provide care for others in the home or in the community or we have special skills and gifts and abilities that enable us to teach children in the public schools or the private schools or, or, or we feel called uniquely to be about mission and we're involved in, in Habitat and Honduras and El Salvador and, and all the other ways that God might use us, or we have a passion to do ministry and to to nurture people in hospice through the most difficult of times in life, or or to be a part of the bereavement team ministries and and be there for families. Um, it, it, It is, we have discovered, part of our DNA, if you will, because our very DNA has shaped us to be God's person in a particular setting and we can decide whether we will serve God or live with the torment of turning to other things, turning our back on God's call and trying to fill life in some other way. And wherever you are, I promise you God can use you. Now maybe you're not at your ultimate place, maybe you feel the leading and and struggle of God pulling you in a new direction. But I would challenge you to look where you are and see what it is God might have you to uniquely do where you are. Whose lives can you touch? What people might you influence? Who might you care for? Who might you express the love of God to? Lori was talking to the children about our New Testament lesson where Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, comes and gets him and brings him into the presence of the Messiah. We know what role Peter plays throughout the rest of the New Testament. Can you imagine if Simon had, I mean, uh, Andrew had never bothered to go and invite his brother to come? What, what the world might be like. God's will will not be stymied, but it would be a whole different story. And certainly Peter would never have fulfilled his calling and his purpose in the way that God intended. So I I ask you to look where you are. Examine what God is doing in your life, what opportunities, what struggles, what challenges He is presenting to you. And reflect upon God's goodness and grace. Know that you are His unique person. There is none other like you. And He loves you. And he sent his son to take your sin and the burden of that sin away from you. And he carried that to the cross so that it would never be a burden for you again. That you would be invited into the very presence of God and a part of his kingdom eternally. 
Wherever you are, you have the opportunity and the choice to make. Will you exert the effort? Will you surrender to the will of God? Will you recognize that the ministry upon which He calls you is one in which you can declare, as did His servant Isaiah, I was born for this. Amen. I invite our officers elect to come forward and stand at the front of the church. And our ordinands are going to be in the middle, facing the congregation. I woke my grandson up during the sermon. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) These are your elders and deacons elect, and today we are ordaining and installing them. There are different ways of serving, as we were just speaking, but it is the same Lord who has served. God works through each of us, each person, in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So I put to you, those of you who are officers elect, uh, eight elders, ten deacons, actually eleven, we've got uh, an unfulfilled term. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and Head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's Word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith and the confessions of our church as authentic? and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? For those of you who are ruling, uh, being installed or ordained as ruling elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless, and those in need, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Barry?
Now I'm going to ask the uh, officers elect to turn and face the cross. And for those being ordained, if you're able to kneel. And I'm going to invite all elders in the church or any elder in the PCUSA to come forward for the laying on of hands for ordination. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age you have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of your people ministering in the power of your spirit. And alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors served together so that your whole people might be equipped for ministry and build into the full unity of Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Harry Davenport, Ann Seaman, Becky Faircloth, Donna Moody, Fred Willis, Becky Neely, Clinton Corbett, Price Freeman, Angie Neal, Karen Rawls, and Megan Winged as deacons, that they may be faithful officers in the church. Give them the openness to the Holy Spirit's leading that they may see and serve wherever there is need. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Walter Neely, Mike Morgan Sr., Trey Horak, Kim Davenport, David Thompson, Leon Daniels, Jacob Cunningham, and Mac Winged as ruling elders, that they may be your faithful elders in the church. Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them all in the life of the Holy Spirit, that they may exercise the ministry of discipline and humility and compassion. Guide them in governance on this session and in every court of the church, that they may be servant leaders following the example of Christ. Finally, Lord, give them all joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. In everything, give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me help those ladies and gentlemen up. You are now ruling elders and deacons in the church. Stay here, folks who came down. Um, and for the, for the church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through the Father. Amen. I invite you to welcome your colleagues into the life and ministry of the church. Take him out. <laughs> Making commentary on my sermon. Ready? Thank you for your Thank willingness you. to serve again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your willingness to serve.
Elders and deacons elect, I'll dismiss you as the last of your colleagues comes by. Thank you very much. Let's bow together in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we celebrate your goodness and grace, and we thank you for the opportunity to come into the power of your presence. And this day especially, we pray for your grace, your spirit to rest upon our officers as they take charge of the various ministries to which you have called them, Lord. Be with, guide, and direct them as only you can. We continue to lift up the many who are grieving the loss of one loved ones. We think of the family of Ruth Hunter, the family of Cindy Hill, the Sam family of Sue Adrino. We pray for Paul and Ann and Susan, Mary Jane and Joe and Patricia, Allison, Jane, John, George, Roy and Doris, Timothy and Conrad and all the many others, Lord, who are on our minds and hearts, who are hurting and broken, who need your care. Lord, we ask and pray that you be with those who serve us in the community, we think of the men and women of our armed services and pray your blessing upon them wherever they may be and especially that you be with families who are separated from one another while on deployment. We pray for those who serve us locally as first responders, firefighters, police officers, EMTs and so many others. We ask that you keep them safe and well and protect them in their service to us. Lord, we pray your guidance to be upon our Congress as we move into a historical event this week, that you would be with and help all who serve to seek the will of the people and not the partisan bickering that we see so much of. We pray, dear Lord, for all leaders that you would guide and direct them in the way in which you would have them to go. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves, for all of us are hurting and broken in some form or fashion and in need of your healing touch. Bless us as only you can. And use us, Lord, wherever we may be, that we might serve you. Let us know that in our hearts we were born for this. For this prayer we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing one more time. Be short and sweet. By the way, if anybody knows any uh, musicians that want to come play up here, please let me know or get in touch with Brian. We always need more. into the world 
in the knowledge of all that Jesus has done for you. The love that He had in His heart and still has for you to this very day. That He would go to the cross in your place, bear the burden of your sin, die the agony that we can only imagine of the hours He spent upon that cross and the beating that He took before just to unburden us of our sins so that we could be welcomed into God's eternal kingdom. This God who loves you beyond measure calls on you to share that good news with all who have yet to hear and believe. That you would go out into the world wherever you may find yourself and recognize God has a purpose for you in that place. And I pray that He will lead you in such a way that you will eventually be in such a place as you can declare before God and all humanity, this is my purpose. This is what I was called to do. I was born for this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.